Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back to League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with your beauties for what's going to probably be an extended praise and glazing of T1 slash SKT after their second straight world championship. There's a lot of history to go on. There's no team in even traditional sports that are so far ahead of all the other organizations, at least most leagues have a couple teams, you know, Lakers and Celtics, two squads that have dominated for decades. But nobody's even close to T1, especially now when you're a decade plus looking at their history, so much so that we have two different eras of dynasties that we're looking at today. And it's picture perfect to have a time like this to talk about the two dynasties that T1 SKT have had over the course of the history of League of Legends because things are changing. We're stepping into a whole new era of League of Legends. The way the scheduling is going to work out, things are going to be very different. It's going to play out really, uh, you know, in, in a way that is wild compared to the past. And you're going to be looking at these championships, these dynasties from SKT and T1. A little differently so now fresh off the most recent championship added to this dynasty time to relive to look back and review these these incredible runs and obviously when you are talking dynasty specifically t1's had a lot of dominant years but we are looking at the two different eras where they went back to back to back world finals runs that is 2015 to 2017 and the more recent 2022 to 2024 and obviously initially the most obvious difference between these is the modern version it was the same five starters year in and year out when you go back to 2015 you have Marin, duke hooney all being rotated out. You had Bangy, Peanut, and Blank. The bot lane of Bang and Wolf stayed true and consistent throughout, and of course, Faker. But that is the biggest difference initially when you're looking at those two teams. And I feel like you could say it's more impressive to have the same five starters, but you could also say it's more impressive to be that dominant over that time while making roster changes. It's going to be an individual evaluation type of thing that you're going to have to go through when you're talking about it, weighing the scales that are here in this situation because yes you look at this current t1 dynasty and you look at zay's owner guma yusi kiria and acknowledge that this has not been done for t1 in the past to have the same roster stick through go through the ups and downs that you do as a champion going from losing in the world championship winning a world championship winning another world championship type of thing for this group it has been a hell of a journey and to see them go through the, all the ups and downs that come through on the rift, off the rift, all those sorts of things. And to still be champions at the end of the day is an impressive feat. Uh, you know, level, going up against everything that everyone is learning about you and how you succeed and then how they counteract it and everything else like that. And then you go back to the original SKT dynasty and you go through a rotating door of players in that top side in the jungle uh, for this team still finding that success, still finding that dominant level that was the established expected performance for SKT at the very top of the tiers of League of Legends. And listen, when you break it down by numbers, the most glaringly obvious thing, and you could know this without the numbers, is the previous dynasty was much more dominant domestically. How many times this modern era have we talked about T1 Lumping through the LCK, not being able to get it done in finals. The 2015-2017 era, they had four LCK titles to their name throughout multiple splits. They even had an IEM uh, win when IEM was still a thing. Obviously, two MSI titles plus a runner-up. The two world, fin uh, world titles plus that runner-up. And 303 wins to the tune of a 72 percent win rate across three years is absolutely absurd it's gonna feel a little strange but i want to throw on to this new t1 dynasty the clutch label but the problem is they haven't been clutch in a various other times because they've been so good to be in a lot of these situations where it is that final boss that last tough challenge at the end of the line 
And they've got a bit of a spotty record in that type of situation when you're looking at those and you're including the domestic tournaments. Uh, of course, you go international, it's a little bit better uh, numbers in the, in the favor of them. But it really has been one of these things where it really shows me that, again, not that SKT, the, the old dynasty, didn't have a lot of that regional competition. It has absolutely exploded and leveled up since that SKT dynasty to try and rise up and match, dethrone them at the top of the LCK, which we have seen from teams like Genji, like Ahanwa Life. But the big thing that I think I've seen you know, has evolved is that SKT early, a lot of the players that you were rotating in, Faker himself was just so mechanically gifted and better than their opponents that they could just overwhelm you in that type of way. Whereas now it's a lot more, uh, you know, in depth, a lot more fine line of where you find that edge over your opponent, why you are better, why you're able to take them down time and time again. And it's that clutch factor, the clutch plays from Faker, clutch moments from the rest of the team. I think that is one of the edges that I would give towards this recent dynasty over the past. And this whole thing is always difficult to really compare because 2015 to 2017, you're talking about the game, the esport as a whole, only being four, five, six years old. And it was clear time and time again at these international events that Faker, as you mentioned, and SKT as an organization in just how they operated and the game sense and game knowledge that the players had were leaps and bounds ahead of let alone other teams in the LCK. But when you went internationally, the gap was this era, you never felt like the West had a chance in any matchups against SKT. This modern era, even how good this roster for T1 has been, we've seen game fives, we've seen them drop games to Western teams. Back then, it was unheard of. If you weren't down 5K gold by 20 minutes, you were getting a round of applause. It's you look at the old SKT dynasty, and I just think the original 151 Pokemon, it is flat out just hey, we got a Charizard, we've got a Mewtwo, whatever it is, Dragonite, Gyarados, we got the power players, we're taking it down. We have those numbers, we have that power in our side. And you go to the current T1, well, they, you could be rolling through their original 151 Pokemon, but everybody else. They've got the like 600, 500, 1000, whatever, how many Pokemon we're up to now with all the different types, all the different moves, all the different evolutions, all these things. That is the way this game has changed and evolved over time. And to be able to still find success and build something like a dynasty, again, the traditional definition for a dynasty, I believe is three championships in a five year window. You can kind of massage that around to being that two champions, the finals appearance type of thing in that same window for T1 for the dynasty status. It's incredible to be able to do that the way the game has evolved, the way the international scene has evolved and leveled up since that original dynasty to be able to bring together another one. Unbelievable stuff. And now when you pull up the numbers for this modern T1, obviously the win percent, 67 percent, five percent less than the other squad. But as we mentioned, they've gone nine and nine in regular seasons. They've bowed out early in playoff runs and had to go through the gauntlet. Uh, but obviously, two world titles and the runner-up is the exact same. No MSI titles, but they've never finished below top three in three straight MSI berths and. The biggest glaring difference is still the LCK titles. Only a single LCK title for this lineup. Obviously, that was the spring split where they went 18-0 and in the regular season before culminating in that title. But four-time runner-up is the big asterisk to see here because despite what happened at this year's Worlds, Gen G was that hurdle final boss that these guys could never get over domestically. And I think this is the sliver. This is that one little, little shard of wood that's stuck in the finger of this incredible run for T1. When you think about all the amazing things, all the proper things that you want to praise and talk about with this team, you're kind of left with the elephant in the room, sweeping it under the rug type of thing of losing to Gen G in those finals time after time after time again type of thing to talk about. It is a blemish on this team, especially when you consider, yes, the priority is without a doubt those international championships, those world championship wins. 
but it doesn't mean that you simply overlook your domestic region. You don't overlook these clashes against a rival in Gen G that we have had and an emerging one in Hanwha life throughout this year that we saw double times in the playoffs. It, it stings because it's the one that prevents this from being, I think, a knockout punch, a knockout blow for the new T1 dynasty. When you talk about all the positive things about it, you're left trying to ignore, trying to hope someone doesn't bring up. Hey, what about, what about all these times with Gen G? What about, what about, what about this barrel guy? What's that record against that guy? You don't want to be talking about those. Uh, yeah, quick shout out, by the way, nothing to do with barrel, but only non-SKT member to have two world championships. Got to shout out Barrel uh, for that one. Doing it on DRX and then Dom one, obviously. But I think the easiest or the most accurate way to talk about these two different eras of T1, because it's hard to just say which one's better. You know, there's too many variables. 2050 to 2017 is the most dominant era of SKT or T1. The modern version is the most skilled. How many times did you see... Even at this World Championship, 4v5s, 3v5s, team fights that nobody sees an angle where T1 should be winning fights and they turn it on its head and take it over. How many montage highlights for every individual player on the team? Guma Kiria in a 2v2, Zeus outplays owner, 1v3s, Baron steals. Every player on this roster at times can be the best in their role. In the world. Right? And one of the things that has changed uh, when you look at the dynasties is, you know, you had obviously the overwhelming mechanical skill initially in that early era of T1 and how they were winning. You step into this team now, and as you said, uh, you know, the individual moments, everybody has it. I think clutch factor, right? Knowing how to win, that I think is one of the separating factors and when to dial it up in these international events has been a big part of it. It's of course, so many questions. Why doesn't it happen against Gen G? All these other things, and uh, more than fair. But I think when we are looking at this and those individual players and how they have leveled up, there is no comparison. Yes, there are a couple of moments, a couple of highlights you can go through. Okay, Wolf's Recon engage, of course, Marin dominating, things like that you can go back to in the old T1 uh, SKT dynasty. This new T11 blows it out of the water. Some of the plays, some of the moments that we have had from Zeus, owner, Guma. Guma, how many times do we say that Guma is the primary jungler for T1? The way that he is stealing all these things. Curious champion pool and the and the variety and wildness that he brings to that role and skill that we know that he has. This T1 lineup is fleshed out, unlike the other SKT lineup that still had to go through that revolving door. And even more so, the biggest change in evolution is the guy that is the same. The one in that mid lane, Faker, through the course of time, there is no way that you can just stick your head in the sand and say that he hasn't grown. He hasn't changed over every experience that he has had in his career from that early dominance of just raw mechanical power. I am better than everybody that exists on this planet type of thing to the middle where it is struggles. I've had my defeat to the hands of saying some galaxy in the world finals. Untara, tall, we don't get the combinations right on this team. And then you get this roster, this iteration, and they find the success that they do to build out another dynasty under the T1 banner. And the thing that both of these teams have in common, both all eras throughout, and Faker's obviously the common denominator here, regardless of how they look domestically, when Worlds comes around, this is a team that should be in the conversation for favorites to win the entire event. Obviously, this year is the most obvious example of that. But even 2017, you know, that was Longshu was so dominant. They just dumpstered SKT in the LCK finals. And people didn't have them at the top of the table uh, in terms of favorites to win the whole event. I know they ended up losing in the finals, but... The fashion that they got there and the level up that you got throughout the event uh, from Faker specifically, but to a lesser degree, the rest of the team as well. Their worst ever finish, not just the two dynasties, we're talking about a semi-finals loss to a stacked Dom one. That's, that's most organizations' career year, and that's their worst performance. That that would be the LCS's greatest performance of all they time. They would drop nope. a banner, lost to Dom One in semifinals. Yeah. Put that right beside the stupid TSM banners that we still have at the LCS studio. Those would be good. I, one of the things I did want to mention with both of these dynasties, of course, is 
the coaching staff. You look at Coma and his role that he's played in these runs, of course, always there with the original SKT run that you go through. Not 100% uh, completion rate in this current T1 dynasty, only being a most recent addition and, and part of it. But I think one of the things that is clear is there's a change even in him throughout all these years through the differences of that dynasty. I think originally it was that don't let Coma see you do something bad. He's going to get the belt out type of situation, whereas much more so now he he's become like a father for this group, for this team type of thing in the way that he approaches it. One of the things I just wanted to mention when you look at both of these dynasties, notice that hey, that's a similar name there, a little bit different in both times around. Though. Yeah, the other difference there was it used to be Coma sitting alone watching on a tiny TV uh, for the team, and that was the entire coaching staff, and now obviously you see it's fully fleshed out. There's multiple guys who have multiple roles, but that's just the evolution of the game, and throughout the entire evolution, it has still been T1 is the premier organization, not just for players and on Rift product, but the infrastructure behind the scenes and top to bottom, how the organization is run. Just look at a guy like Reckless coming over here and saying, you know, he's been on Fnatic, he's been on G2, and time and time again, he said, T1, it's completely different here compared to other teams. You play a sports video game. It's like going from the minor leagues to the major leagues, and you notice, like, holy moly, everything is just... Everything's done here professionally. Guys got things going on. They know what to do and when to do it. That's exactly the type of program that T1 has got there. Reckless seeing that compared to the LEC even, the LEC Titans and G2 and Fnatic, uh, a little bit of a, a wake-up call, I think, to everybody in the West to see how things have been going there. It's an incredible story to think that you have both of these ones, uh, story dynasties within the, the history of League of Legends and to get one like this on the run that T1 have been on, with the possibility to keep extending this dynasty, that is wow. something really special. As soon as, if you add another year with this roster, then 2015, 2017 is fully by the wayside. Oh yeah, especially running it back with these with these four and Faker, you gotta like the chances for them, especially best of fives, best of three. You start locking it down into that type of territory. This is a T1 that is scary, scary with their backs against the wall. And let's be honest, uh, even if there's roster changes, you know it's inevitable. T1 will eventually get back to the top of that mountain, regardless of who's on it. There's just an aura around the entire organization, which is why they have the biggest fan base in the world when it comes to League of Legends. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you. Absolutely gorgeous individuals. Thanks for hanging out, as always, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.